everyone, this is Arzu, and welcome back to another episode of Arzu Art Podcast. I've been thinking with myself, and I thought to make a little bit of changes to my podcast. Um, so far, we had so many great interviews with amazing artists, and. I was just thinking to change the way that I interview people and um, have a more of a solo um, podcast. So let me know what sort of subject you want me to talk about and um, drop me a message wherever you want to. You can find me in every platform under the name of Arezu Art. My today's guest is Zaruhi Galstian. She is an Armenian-American character designer who is mostly well-known for her work on Coco Pixar and also her wood-burning crafts. In this podcast, we talked about Zara's life as a first generation of Armenian immigrant to America and how she got into animation. Zar also gives great tips about her process of character designing and her inspiration behind her works, especially in Coco. The attention to details and patterns and moreover her passion for wood burning and creating beautiful handmade artworks. Last but not least, Zara talks about her idea of putting her art into a good cause for helping Armenian community by creating an Instagram page called Animators for Armenia. So I just cut it short and let's go and hear more about Zara's journey. Hi, it's morning in, are you based in San Francisco at the moment? Morning in San Francisco. You know, I'm not in San Francisco anymore. I moved to Central oh, California by a river. Ooh. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Ooh. Sunny. <laughs> wow, lucky you. He is freezing cold. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, so good to have you, Zar. So, um, Thank you. Yeah, so you are from Armenistan, which is also a neighbor to Iran, so we are neighbors. <laughs> Absolutely, yes. So, yeah, um, originally from tell, Armenia. Yeah, so tell me about yourself, how um, long you lived in Armenia, and when did you move to America? And I just really want to hear all about your childhood and how did that transition go for you? Oh, yeah. Um, yes, I was born in Armenia in Yerevan, and um, I lived there for the first six years of my life. We moved to America. <laughs> yeah, we moved to America in 93. Um, I was six years old. And my childhood there was just really, like, like a really pure childhood. And I know, like, uh -huh. it's hard to imagine now because every, every, I think we all kind of, like, look at our lives based off of what we have now with technology and all of that. But we had none of that there. Like, Armenia at the time was under the Soviet Union. So yeah. we... You know, it was like a very sheltered kind of um, Soviet bubble that we lived in. <laughs> but um, a really beautiful childhood. You know, there was a lot. Obviously, there's a lot going on with the country and all of that. But my parents and family did such a good job to, like, um, shelter us from um, a lot of the craziness that was going on. Yeah, like, uh, we had no electricity, at, you know, towards the towards mm -hmm. the end of end of the years and there was just I, I remember like having a moment where I know a lot of people have heard this story but it's just like one that's really poignant from my childhood um yeah. it was winter and Armenia has like really brutal cold winters and we um we had no electricity no fire no no way to stay warm so my mom would like play piano for me and my sister to dance to stay warm Aww. And they're candlelit, you know, that sort of thing. So it was, uh, it was challenging, but also really like fun. And, um, everyone was just like, there's such a sense of community and family. And, and, uh, I grew up with such a big family with my cousins, uncles, like the neighborhood, like we would go outside and play games, you know, with the whole neighborhood, like the kids, like you don't see that or have that sort of experience. So that's sort of like really innocent kind of like fun, playful childhood, you know, and my parents, um, my mom, her, 
my grandparents, her parents, where, where she was raised, the house that she was raised, my grandparents are still alive and live there. It's right yeah. by an ancient Armenian fortress called the Erebuni Fortress. Okay. That was just kind of also like the background of, of places we played around, you know? So uh, growing up in like a very ancient land with like really deep roots and all of that, and you take that for granted, but now I look back and I'm like, yeah, dude, I was stomping around, you know, like Erebuni Fortress, you know, where like these ancient Armenian kingdoms were at. So that's pretty cool when you <laughs> look back, you know, as far as your childhood goes. Yeah. Um, yeah. Oh, <laughs> that's beautiful. Yeah. I think um, we also in Iran, went back to the time we were young, we had also like sort of the same experience. But um, yeah, I mean, we, I also have a big family and yeah, and it's, it's, it's a it's cute to when you keep thinking of those times how things were different and as you were saying there was like no technology so you were focused on BF and doing things and being creative of I don't know uh, making up games or and um, would you just say that your mom was keep playing piano it was just a, like a creative way to keep you warm which was really cool so yeah and what made you to move to america then because you when you were six so it's exactly like by the time you had to go to school then yeah so um uh the soviet union collapsed so um, um a lot of people a lot of armenians um there was like a mass kind of like exodus like the last like few years of like the government just like collapsing and all that um a lot of people moved to the states um, kind of like all around, really. Um, my family yeah. happened to move to California, to Glendale, California, mm-hmm. uh, where like there's a huge Armenian population in Glendale. So that's where we moved. Oh, okay. Cause the year before, my uncles and my grandmother had moved there. So that's where we moved to. And life completely changed, you know? It was like going from that kind of like bubble to like cereal and like um TV Power Rangers <laughs> TV you know granted we we had like a lot of bootleg copies of like movies um in Armenia too I remember Tremors being one where it was like uh uh we would watch it all the time Pretty Woman being another one <laughs> just all these like <laughs> inappropriate movies like contraband that we would get and like watch in Armenia <laughs> But, um, <laughs> yeah, and and more exposure to, like, all the animated films, you know. I grew up watching the mm-hmm. Russian animated films in Armenia. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, Armenian um, movies, too, but we didn't really have access to, like, the Disney stuff. So when I moved to America, it was like, oh, yeah, like, um, a lot of, like, the, you know, Aladdin and, and um uh, Little Mermaid and all that stuff. So yeah, yeah. all those golden classicals movie from Disney. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so so was, I think, yeah, please go. Ahead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I'm thinking that although it was like a big change, but because there was so many new things, you still had so much enthusiasm and you you were having fun. It seems like you were okay with that change. Oh, totally. Because, you know, you're a kid, too, and you don't really know. You're just going through, like, the motions, like, wherever your parents tell you to do and go. That's kind of what, what happens, but, um, <laughs> obviously. Uh, but, um, yeah, uh, it was just, like, that that change, you know. And um, we could get into more about, like, the cultural kind of shifts, you know, of, of having immigrant, being the first-generation immigrant trying to like hold on to your home and identity with like this new culture you know this new way of thinking new way of being um and there's a lot of struggles that come with that you know like in a real way but we always had our family like our big extended family and like we held on to as much of our culture and um traditions and things like that as we could so we yeah, we kind of like yeah. transported our home to another, another land, you know, which is hard yeah. for an Armenian because we're so tied to our land, but that's been our like history, the beginning of time, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. I, I actually talk about immigration with uh, some of my guests, like w- what you mentioned with like Katana in my uh, first episode and also with Tuna Bura. She's from Turkey. We mm-hmm. talk about immigration a lot and how these cultural differences can affect you and even your career or 
you know. So I was actually thinking that we also have like minority of uh, Armenian in Iran that we usually like Iranian are a huge fan of whatever Armenian cooks, but especially the sausages, you know. <laughs> but in <laughs> Iran, they make like the best hot dogs ever. And like it, they're Armenian who makes them. So, um, yeah, I mean, yeah, so uh, you, what you were talking about, like, uh, scattering around the world, so that minority of Armenian who are in Iran, they are amazing cooks, so that's so good, yeah, and they're all amazing people, so I almost know someone who know an Armenian who they like, oh, they're the best, <laughs> so it was like, oh, that's that. Yeah, they're always like um, known for their like very um, I don't know welcoming character and yeah that sort of thing, which is really lovely. So you uh, were you also into like drawing or were you like draw a lot when you were a kid? Now that you saw like Disney movies and other things, so how you kept yourself creative? Tell me about that. Yeah, I always drew as a kid. Very like. I'm like crafty, you know. I work with my hands mm. a lot. My dad is a tra- a tailor by trade, um, by profession. So I grew up kind of like, um, I guess that like working with your hands, craftsmanship just like runs in the mm. family. And my mom too, very okay. creative. Like when you're talking about food, like my mom comes to mind because she is just like the best cook ever. Um, <laughs> you're and I have like. Yeah, I know. Yeah. And, and, and I could go into a whole thing about food and like how it's just like, you know, a lot of the recipes and stuff she cooks is just like family heirlooms that have just been passed down from like our generation. Um, great yeah. generations. Yeah. And then mm-hmm. food is so like very interesting because it has such a like specific history, you know, with like mm-hmm. the regions that you go. But anyway, I tangent. Um, I, I get very passionate about food too. Um, yeah. But, uh, <laughs> yeah. As far as like, because food is also creative, really creative too. Cooking is super. It creative. is. Yeah. Um, and nourishing. Uh, yeah, as far as like, um, drawing, yeah, always drew. My sister drew too. Um, I think I kind of had more of like an introduction to art through my sister because I saw her because she's two years older than me. And, okay. Uh, like in high school and stuff, she, um, she took art classes and I was like, Oh, I, I could take art classes too. So it was just one of those, um, I think she was kind of like the gateway. She didn't really uh, pursue it. I definitely got the bug. Um, but always drew, um, loved animation. Me and my sister always like created like cut out dolls and we would make clothes for them and like, you know, lovely. play with them. Um, yeah. So. Very crafty, very creative. Because again, like we didn't, we grew up like we didn't have access to like fancy toys and things like that. So we had to like keep ourselves um, entertained, and we yeah. had it through humble means, you know, just like making the best of what we had. We had like cheap Barbies. I remember, um, I really like when you know when when you come to America. When we came to America, you would always see commercials about like all the toys that like, Hasbro, like. By the newest Barbie, my size Barbie, Barbie Jeep. And you're like, oh, I want all of those things. But we didn't have money for that because it was really expensive. Uh, so my, yeah. grandma, my grandma went to like, you know, like a thrift store and bought these like knockoff Barbies. And I remember they're hollow on the inside. And me and my sister would like push their boobs in because it was like plastic. <laughs> But anyway, we would always make like, um, we would go to, uh, my parents had a dry cleaners and my dad was a tailor at the time too. So we would go and, um, any kind of like scraps that my dad had for making alterations, we would sew like, um, uh, clothes for our like knockoff Barbies. So that's kind I of see. like, uh, um, <laughs> How you keep yourself entertained at that time. <laughs> totally. And like, I guess that's sort of like, it, it fosters more of that, that creative parts of myself, I guess. Yeah, that's so cool. And then, um, you, um, end up in Calor for studying animation for real. How did that happen? Yeah. So yeah, CalArts, um, you know, I was in high school and I went to, it wasn't like a specific 
it didn't have too many art classes, but the ones that it did offer were really good. And I remember there was a pamphlet, like a whole bunch of pamphlets in my art class about this summer school program, which was called CESA, California State Summer School for the Arts. And I took the pamphlet home that night. And I, I remember I was like sitting in my bed reading about like animation. And it was just one of those like moments where like, you know, when like your heart just fills up and you're like, Dun dun dun, like the the cloud part, angels sing, like the light beams <laughs> down on you and, and I read the light is beaming down on you now too. <laughs> oh <laughs> Yeah, there's yeah, re- uh, recreating the scene for us, yeah. <laughs> tell me <laughs> tell me about the scene. Yeah. Oh my god. Um yeah, so uh yeah, I was just reading about animation about this program and before that too, I had done um, I had done theater a little bit in like middle school. I was part of like plays and I loved acting and movies and animation. So when I read the description for animation, I was like, "All right, this is the perfect mixture of everything that I love. You know, it's drawing, yeah. it's acting, like, and I love animated movies. Like, so yeah, I read that. I read that program and it was at. CalArts. And I read about CalArts too and how Disney fun- founded the school to, you know, train animators and, and, and filmmakers. Yeah. I read about the school's history and I was like, okay, I need to go here. So I just kind of like found my way. And I went to that, I applied for that summer school program. And I had to like, me and my mom had to come to my dad because it was like, you had to go there for a month, you know, out of, and you know, as like having, um, Kind of, I had like really strict Armenian parents, you know, traditional oh. Armenian parents. So okay. it, it okay. took a little bit of convincing to let my dad, like, to convince my dad, like, oh, look, it's only like an hour and a half away. Um, she's just going to be there for the month, you know, because we dormed there. And that was like just an incredible experience. It totally like solidified. I was like, okay, I'm going to CalArts, I'm being an animator. So I applied to CalArts and I got in and yes, and that was like, just like the best four years ever. Um, just the experience and the friendships that I made and everything that I learned. And it was just a amazing collective of like animation nerds like me who love the craft and, and we all kind of just learned together and taught each other and grew as people. It was a good experience. Yeah. And did you also made any shorts, um, for during that four years i did yes yeah <laughs> how did that go <laughs> you know you know i look back at it now and it was just uh a learn like it was a time of me learning and trying new things i guess it's nothing that like i'm like oh my god i, I made great films and it's just not the <laughs> yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. i, I failed so yeah. much and it, you know i just like imposter syndrome my way through that whole experience <laughs> And, uh, <laughs> yeah, don't worry about it. But, yeah. but did you, by the time you were studying, did you feel like more, because you just mentioned you love animating. So did you feel like you want to become an animator or then you figure out that, okay, I want to be a character designer. That's, I mean, did you figure it out by that time during that four years? You know what? That's a great question. Um, I initially wanted to be a 2D animator animator yeah because yeah. you know you, you uh, the nine old men like frank and ollie and i was like yeah i want to i want to uh, absolutely experience. get it yeah you know <laughs> so it was, it was totally that but then um you know everything at that point was switching to cg and and i just i i love to draw you know and after making my third film um i i got like i had developed a, a pretty good portfolio of visual development stuff for the film that I created. Um, all the animation skills that I had, the design phase that I went through with designing the characters. So I had a pretty mm-hmm. good portfolio. And um, that's when I got my, I, I got an internship with Pixar for, for character design. So my intent was like, oh, I'm, I want to put a reel together. You know, it was my third year. So I still kind of like, everyone was like, oh, and do this. And I was like, I just don't know yet. So after getting that opportunity and and um, working, um, I got to work on Toy Story 3 in that internship. And ah. yeah, it was it was really fun. Like I, I got to like work in a, a professional art department. And that I, I feel like that also like that solidified like, oh, this is what the job entails. This is like this is actually a lot of fun. And I get to work with 
characters, which was like my big passion, you know. And what I realized too was my 2D animation knowledge really helped. Like it really served me really well in that job because, you know, I when you're designing a character for 3D, you have to know how to like turn them around. And you have to think like volumetrically when designing a character. So that skill set really, really helped me. And it kind of just went in that direction. And I just like, I tried to do like um, CG animation and all of that. And I, I realized that my passion really, really kind of um, aligned with drawing. Because I spent so much time just like uh, developing that skill you know yeah and i think also you you said yeah. you you really like to you, you are into handcrafts and such so you don't really want to work with computers so you prefer working with hands as well yeah. totally yeah and yeah and like i feel like my connection with the character too when you're putting like pencil to paper you know and you're like searching for it there's just like there's something that happens with the tangible like the effort of like working your body towards this like finding what this character is or who this character is and and um i still find that i can tap into some of that acting you know um that i i i love with 2d with finding like a character in a pose like finding that expression that um or the state of mind or the psychology behind the character when you're putting it on paper so you know a lot of that 2d kind of just blends into the character design thing and again like my passion is really characters developing characters thinking about character um i love thinking about their psychology and like what makes them who they are and all of that and sometimes it's more successful than others and that's fine too but that's always the goal i guess so yeah i just went into that direction i've gone tangents <laughs> but um yeah, yeah i yeah so after that experience really solidified character design and i just kind of pursued that in my career still doing it <laughs> yeah oh, yeah amazing so did, did you just after you finished your internship you, you got hired by pixar as well or no so after my internship i went back to um cal arts to finish my oh, obviously course. you had to finish oh yeah yeah, right, yeah i got my bachelor's which is you know it was a nice thing to get uh and I worked down in L.A. for a little bit at um, Disney Toon Studios. They did the oh, okay. um, they did the Tinkerbell movies. Um, oh. So I got to work on one of those Tinkerbell movies, designing little fairy costumes and fairy characters, which was fun. <laughs> Looking back now, yeah. I was like, oh, this is fun. This is cute. And then I met <laughs> really great people and got to work with some really great people, too. So that was, that was fun. And then... Um, after that, I got a phone call from Pixar because they were at Ooh. the time, at the time they were doing a lot of the Toy Story shorts. And uh, at the time too, um, Pixar had like a little studio in Canada, uh, which no longer exists, but that's where they were doing like the Toy Story kind of like division there. They're doing a lot of animation okay. there. So I got hired on, um, a Toy Story short called Partysaurus Rex. <laughs> I don't know. If you, I don't know if you've seen it. It's just so cute. It's like one of my favorite shorts. Yeah, and I, I can't remember <laughs> that one to be honest. Maybe I've seen it, but um, yeah, I can't recall it at the moment. I think it's on YouTube. You could watch it, or it's like on Disney. Plus yeah, yeah. But, yeah. but the toys having a rave in a bathtub. So pretty cool. <laughs> yeah, I, I remember something with the yeah bathtub and this rubbing ducklings and stuff, but I'm not sure. Yeah, yeah I think you've probably seen it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and then that kind of started my, like, uh, journey and career at Pixar. Um, I got, after that, I just, I went into, uh, like, a few other shorts, uh, Toy Story shorts, and then um, uh, I went on to Coco, which I was on Ooh. for, like, yeah, which I was on for, like, four years. It was a pretty you long four time. years on Coco? Oh, my God. Not yeah. to mention that you, okay, well, then. And you got any awards for best character for Coco as well. Well deserved. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yeah, it was such a labor of love, and our team was like so great. We went through yeah. like our whole, uh, our own like character arcs on that, um, on that production and show, and worked so hard to like. Like looking back too, it's like you know, the in retrospect, it's like you get so much. Like wow, we really put a lot of effort and, and care and love into that. Yeah, that see, 
It's uh, interesting because you were mentioning that you were like your dad was it was a tailor and you also like to design costumes for your I don't know Barbie dolls or dolls and then you got the chance to design like costumes for Tinkerbell and then Coco there are lots of like um, there are not only like character designs but there are so much I think custom designs and patterns and putting that Mexican culture into the movie and it's just so colorful and I'm pretty sure that it needs a lot of like research and clothing culture and all that so how was your experience on Coco? Tell me more about it in terms of like researching and designing. Oh, yeah. I mean, research was like, I think that's what I mostly meant about um, so much care and attention to detail was the extraneous research that we did. Um, you know, the crew took like multiple trips down to Mexico, Mexico for Dia yes. uh, de Muertos, and we um, uh, lots of photos, just the experience of it too, you know, being there in the cemetery. I didn't go with the crew, but I had gone with a, a separate trip with, uh, my friend Deanna, which I think was, on, she was on a podcast too. A little yes, it time. was. But yes. Yeah, me and Dee, um, we took a, a La Brie painting workshop there. And, um, oh. yeah, so like just the experience of being there, you know, being in the cemetery, in those candlelit cemeteries and having, seeing all the families around the grave sites of their loved ones. And, you know, it was just, it just showed me like, you know, such a different approach to, um, death, you know? Um, yeah. Which goes into like a that, different, yeah. yeah. But like have it like like I mean you're make we're making a movie about the the uh the the de muertos and you have to like know and have that experience you know so um I think all of that everyone who had that experience like acknowledged like in their soul like what what we were trying to capture on the screen you know and that stuff is like no matter how much research you look on Google like it's not mm. it doesn't cha it, like having an experience you know really really paints your view of what you're trying to capture in a different color in a different you know so that was the goal and um yeah that's the kind of like research that we try to do and like put into the movie and and Mexico is just culturally is just so rich, you know, like, and all the women are so like beautiful with what they wear and the colors and, and their costumes that like, they have traditional clothing that they wear like on a daily, you know? Um, so, and making sure like one big thing too was like making sure that the people were represented fairly, yeah. you know, as character designers were like, how do we represent these people in these small villages, you know, and, and do them justice and not put that like, um, stereotypical like animation kind of like filter over it, you know, which is fine, I guess, but we wanted to really, and I hope it was successful and I don't know. Um, mm -hmm. feels like the, the, reception from everyone is pretty good so yeah that's kind of like the stuff we pulled from you know like real life like actual real yeah. life and yeah that's the goal yeah i was going to say like uh, especially i mean the day of that is also interesting for me although i've never like experienced it to be in there and witness it but because in our culture that is something like full of sorrow and it's just really like dark something something really sad but how I, I i just feel like how mexicans doing it is more like celebrating life rather than having sorrow for death which is really beautiful and it's just always so colorful whereas in our culture it's all black so um <laughs> When you were talking about like seeing that from another perspective, I just feel like that that's also the same for me because yeah, it's just like totally different approach to that and talking about that, which is really interesting. Yeah. Oh, totally. And I think like I don't think like the grieving process changes, right? Like I don't I don't necessarily think that there's like a shortcut to like not to say that you were saying this at all. Um it's just something yeah. that comes up what um like the grieving process for someone losing someone you know who is no longer in a physical body on this realm that yeah. we all live in um i don't think that changes i think everyone still grieves and and has to adjust to not having them there but there's yeah. just like a, a another layer of spirituality there and 
yeah, like the understanding, like I think that comes from their ancient roots, you know, like the um, like seeing their history, too. Uh, and I'm not an expert at all whatsoever, but um, like that's their like ancient, there's ancient civilization, you know, these ancient civilizations like really fascinate me so much because like these are the kind of things that like have so like live over like any sort of colonization or anything like that um and you see that within their culture too is like the the stuff that has like survived you know with the incorporation of the new or you know their history another tangent but yeah i feel like it also like that level of celebration is like you acknowledge them as a spirit you know they're no longer in body and this is just my own belief but it's like you get to mm. sit with them and remember them and you know the, the the soul or spirit is no longer in a body but i honestly believe that they're still there you know yeah and they it depends on like what you what your beliefs are in the spiritual capacity but that's 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 my belief anyway <laughs> and uh, yeah yeah and um it it also like you know that level of like um celebration of life like you're saying i feel like what's the word it brings closure to um to like the accepting of a loved one passing you know because mm-hmm. mm-hmm. like not to get into you know talking about like <laughs> super like sad death or whatever but mm-hmm. no you know, no worries like, at all yeah yeah um yeah it celebrates like you're saying it celebrates their life you know and you remember them as people and not just like them not being there like the focus yeah, yeah of your intention on something that is uplifting and and heals instead of like you know yeah. brings you down i feel like that that's really powerful and yeah it's beautiful yeah. yeah and that's something that i took away from that experience that's lovely yeah and i, I think in every project that you work on you because you, uh, there are a lot of like research going on um and there are whole different stories behind every I don't know, pizza movie or whatever project that you're working on. So it's really cool that you are also gaining a lot of like, I don't know, knowledge, research and through that research, which is really interesting as well. Yeah. Is that the same for like other projects? Like, I don't know, for um, you worked on Luca as well. So obviously you had to explore another part of the world with that project. Uh, Well, Luca, I wasn't really on that project for too long. So um okay. at all and it was really early on um it was oh, when okay. the director was still in development so they were they were kind of just pitching a few ideas to see what gets greenlit mm-hmm. and i was just brought on really early on to help with the um, with the project that did go on to become luca um mm-hmm. but i didn't i wasn't on the when it was in production i wasn't on the project but i did some early concept stuff for for enrico when he was uh, still kind of exploring yeah, interesting. Yeah. Now that we just talk about like um character design and all that, can you okay, we talked about like research blah but can you tell me more about what are you were also like mentioning that you really love to go into the characters, see the about like their psychology, how they think and all that. So can you tell me more about your process of character design? Like what are some of the things that you think about? Not to mention that the is straight against the curve that is <laughs> it was also your podcast name. <laughs> yeah. And it's one of the rules in character design. <laughs> <laughs> and I can see that a lot in your designs as well, that straight skin curve. So, <laughs> other than that, that is also also checks <laughs> what are some of the things that you usually like, what are the process that you think? <laughs> yeah, um, which, is part, which is one of the reasons why we named it that was because of the principle and also like um, you know, being females with curves, you know. Wink, wink, yeah. wink, wink. Um, anyway. wink, wink. <laughs> One of the first things that I do, just as far as like process wise, is on obviously mm-hmm. research. I mean, we talked at length about like research, but yeah, just putting together like ideas. If there's any sort of like, and I think it all depends too on where where the character is, you know, in development with what they're thinking. How early on is the character? Because sometimes we'll get a lot of good intel from the director on what they want for the character. 
Mm-hmm. And other times, like, it's just a blank slate where you're like, okay, there's no ideas. There's basic ideas, like, oh, the male was thinking this age, you know, blah, blah, blah. So you kind of just go on, like, a little, like, quest. <laughs> quest to find, um, well, I do anyway, um, quest to find details and, like, uh, good, um, uh, juicy character bits and ideas. So, mm-hmm. you know, if it's like, let's say a character is like a dog or something, then I'll like, okay, what kind of breed of dog is it? And I'll try to like, just draw from life, you know, and get myself like, and get my hand familiar with drawing the anatomy a little bit. So that that is kind of just like muscle memory. And I could go into like, um, designing, designing the character and, and having fun with, um, with who they are and all of that. So research definitely. And Honestly, like a lot of this thing, a lot of, a lot of it takes time too. And having pauses and quiet moments for myself, like I always like find myself going out in nature a lot, um, just to like sit with the character and, and like just seeing what comes to me, you know, like as far as like going out into the world and like you'll see something and you're like, oh my God, like that would be the perfect thing for this character. And, you know, like kind of like, putting an intention out into the universe of like, what, what can you give me for this? Who, who, who is this person? Like what, what kind of like rich stuff can I get? You know, the, the juicy stuff. And then you kind of just go from there. Um, or I do anyway. And I just start to like draw and it kind of like evolves, you know, as the story evolves, you get more information, you know, you'll have art reviews and things like that. And the director's like, definitely not that. And you're like, all right. <laughs> And uh, it gives you just intel and you kind of just hone in on a character um, with a director and as the story kind of like evolves, you know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. How about like in terms of like, um, um, because in your characters, I also see a lot of like yeah, textures, a lot of like patterns, uh, even in your wood burning, which I'm going to talk about that soon too. You mm. use a lot of like textures and uh, patterns, and I I just feel like they also add another layer of meaning to your characters. I mean, it's not only like shapes and um, I mean the basics of the character. Like you said, if it's a dog, okay, obviously you know what kind of breed it is. The anatomy and all that is good. The shapes are good, but then you're adding more layers into that, like adding textures, adding patterns. You know? Yeah, I I love detail love detail um it's it's, uh i get lost in it and i think all of that adds like you know like individuality to a character you know um it's all just means for storytelling really and hopefully like that that translates over to who the character is what they like because anytime um i I work on costuming or patterns or anything like that. It's always like, I always try to think of it as like, okay, this is a character that this is a person. They have a closet full of clothes. What do they like? What do they go and, and pick out for themselves? You know, what, what would this character wear? This character would like, let's say wouldn't be caught dead in polka dots. Okay. All right. You know, like you kind of just, I don't know. I'm just making stuff up, but you can hopefully like, um, time permitted and like but this is kind of like the the way that I try my best to think when like approaching that sort of thing and yeah so hopefully it's a means for storytelling because there's a lot of like um you know design principles and things like that that lend itself really well to uh certain patterning like one example that I think of was I don't know if it was on the Incredibles or I don't know I forget what move but it was when the care I think it was when Bob was like, um, you know, in, in the in the beginning of the movie where he feels kinda trapped. You know, I had seen some designs where, you know, there was like stripes on his shirt and it kind of felt oh, like yeah. a jail cell, you know, like uh, so had, and then the pattern of the post was yeah, had meanings into that story. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Totally. So hopefully yeah. as a designer you're thinking you know, like about the mood of the movie, about the character and where they are emotionally. And because it's all in service to a film, right? I mean, this is the language that we're working in. Um, so, you know, knowing the mood, 
knowing the emotional state of a character because like sometimes Mm -hmm. like if i feel like crap and i wake up in the morning all i want to wear is like sweats and like dark colors and like i just want to disappear in like fabric you know so like thinking of the emotional state of the character like dictates what decisions you make for their clothing you know, and, and hopefully like the patterning and all of that is in service to that emotional need for the film. I say, I say. So tell me about your wood burning. Your name is AKA Burn Me Happy. <laughs> <laughs> so you have so many like, um, what's called woodcrafts and you are doing a lot of like character designs on wood and they are also amazing. So, um, Tell me how that starts and what sort of like, I don't know, tell me about that, putting your art on wood, burning it to the wood. I don't know how to put it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. All the above, I guess. <laughs> you know, it started, the seed was planted really young. I had an uncle who had a, a soldering iron, like wood burner, and he had okay. this giant cork board. And every time I'd go to his house, I do like, I do drawings on it with this thing. And he trusted like, you know, I, I was like 12 or 13 or something, just like young, young adult, uh, even younger. Um, yeah. And I, I would just go and like draw with this flaming hot instrument and burn into a cork board, you know, it was mostly horses because I was obsessed with horses at the time, but that's where I guess the, the, the seed was planted and You know, a lot of like the artwork that I did do too, like in my time at CalArts and it was just, I loved line work, you know, and I had this like, in high school too, I had like a fine art phase too. So it wasn't just all animation, you know, I had like, I was doing portraiture and things like that. And I'm really, really obsessed with artists with like line work and doing figure drawings, just exploring that sort of thing. So Mm -hmm. it dawned on me, I was like, oh, dude, like this, I could pick this up again, you know? Um, and I got, I got myself like a professional wood burning kit and I just started, started going. Um, and I don't know if it's like my Armenian pagan roots, you know? I don't know, like if it's like the, I always loved like fire too, like playing with fire. Um, so I think it's just a combination of like, um, uh, all those things. And I was like, oh, all right, like I'm, I'm gonna burn, burn my art into wood. I don't know. There's, and there's something very like meditative about doing it too, where you just have to be very present when you're doing it. It's like mm-hmm. it demands your attention, demands your respect, because if you like mess up, you can like really hurt yourself. So mm-hmm. yeah. Also, yeah. there is like no undo button, and I was also going to say that it's like you need to be really focused because uh, it's not like paper or eraser or something. You have to. I mean, you can mess up, obviously. <laughs> you have to get the lines and everything right. Yeah. There's a lot of planning that goes like. You know, there, and a lot of times there isn't, you know, a lot of the instruments and stuff that, I mean, I'm sorry, the ornaments, the ornaments yeah. that I've been making for Christmas and that, that all yeah, of them. Yeah, that so cute. Thank you. A lot of those is just like stream of consciousness, whatever just flows out. And that's why like each one is like unique and individual, like with that way. It's just whatever is just flowing. So that happens to just get into like a flow state and just go with it. And like you're saying, it's, uh, if you make a mistake, one, there's no, there's really no going back. Either you have to like, if it's a terrible mistake, you're like, okay, I just have to trash it, which has happened like plenty of times, I assure you. Um, or it's like, can this mistake be incorporated into the design? Happy accident. You know? Yeah. Happy accident. Like happy accident. Or like you make, yeah. totally. So you <laughs> kind of just like make, make that work too. And, and that's happened too. Sometimes you're like, okay, well, all right, I'm just going to change the design of, of this. And you try it out, and if it's salvageable, then great. If it's not, then it's not. And you move yeah. on. So there's this level of, like, um, I don't know, like being okay with letting go of, of it, um, which kind of, like, again, which kind of sucks because it's not just a piece of paper you could crumble. It's like a piece of wood, you know, and you're like, oh, this is like a piece of a tree, um, which makes it, precious in that way too but also mm-hmm. like you have to yeah like i like that it commands your attention in that way 
Like you can't be doing yeah. something else or thinking about something else, like and not be fully present with it. So it's for me, it's just been like this um, outlet, like a very personal outlet for myself, and it's just like my favorite medium to work in. And it's like me time, you know. Yeah. Um, I was going to ask that because um, how do you make the colors change? Do you burn them as well or there are different woods because sometimes I see in some of your works there are different brown so how how does that work just curious you know yeah so um the different browns like I one um if it's like I, I work in different veneers too so different species of wood with like cutouts uh. like, cause I've had some um like a body of artwork that has like cut out so they're like small little veneers and I, and I work with different wood species and that in oh, itself okay. has just been like really a beautiful thing to explore and um mm. stain wood stain so I uh, the ones that look more um like it's more painted that color oh, yeah okay. I will stain it based off of like oh the hair I want to stain this color so it's still within the like wood family you know it's not like yeah. bright and colorful, but it kind of has that like effect, I guess. Uh, okay, okay, yeah, because I, I was thinking that how did you get that like different shades of brown? <laughs> uh, and you just mentioned that it's like sort of like comes from your uh, Armenian roots. And I see a lot of like pomegranates in your works. And sometimes you draw like um, these ladies with Armenian dresses. So how is it for you? Like, because obviously I, I, I just feel like also it's like that for you as you go further in your career, you're started to bring your Armenian culture into your work as well. And I'm seeing that more recently from you as well, which is really beautiful and unique. So if you want to talk about that as well, because yeah, Tom Grana for life. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, girl. <laughs> 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 no, totally. <laughs> like, because I see it quite often in your work as well. Yeah, um, I can't take any credit for the pomegranate, but you know, one thing that I do, <laughs> I well, it's just kind of been ingrained. It's been such a symbolic kind of symbol that I've grown up seeing like my whole life. You know, like okay. uh, it's just a, it's just a weight woven into the the cultural like symbolic symbolism of um, Armenia, and I'm sure Iran too. With like yeah, it's a, it's a it's the same, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's a very sacred fruit. I feel like, especially in that region. So yeah, like you know, you see it on buildings, on, on ancient artwork, and and all of that. So it's kind of like it's symbolic in a lot of ways. Um, it is. Part of like symbolism. I, I love it. I love it. Um, so I just I, I I like working with it, and um, I. I like to think that I like to think that people like maybe like subconsciously get the symbolism um, uh, mm -hmm. of it <laughs> in my work too. Uh, but uh, yeah, I, I don't know about that. But uh, it's just beautiful. At the end of the day, it's beautiful, and I I I I think it brings a lot of joy. They look like they look like jewels, you know, like the, the yeah. little kernels. It's just so beautiful. So yeah, I that answered your question. <laughs> But, <laughs> it's interesting because some of my uh, European friends haven't eaten pomegranate, so I was like introducing them it to them. So because like, uh, do you also celebrate the longest night of the uh, Shabbat We say yeah, Yalov night. I think in Romania, oh. do we have that night too? You know, I'm not sure. What so what what day does that land on? It's on the last day of autumn. So that's like the longest night of the year. And then you know, that's I, where we celebrate and we eat pomegranates, we eat fruits, nuts, and all that. Oh, no, we, I don't know if we have something like that in Armenia. Um, I wonder if it's because, I, I, yeah, I don't, well, my family doesn't. I don't know if other Armenians do, um, but I'm not. I'm not sure that. either. I, yeah, yeah, I'm not sure. But anyway, so, yeah, um, a lot of, like, my friends are not familiar with, like, pomegranate <laughs> so i was like introducing them to them this is a fruit <laughs> oh my god that's so weird right like, 
something you grew up <laughs> with, like it's so important to you. Other people don't know too much about it. Yeah, and that's really interesting. And you also recently, with all the like things that are happening in Armenia, are supporting like Armenia with art, and you got this page called Animators for Armenia, which you um support the whole thing with like it's like art for a good cause, I would say. Uh, do you want to talk about that? How that pay stock? How you raise you raise a lot of money as well? So yeah, uh, it was kind of like our um, our uh, Captain Planet moment, you know, where um, uh, like a few years ago, like a year, I don't even remember how many how much time has gone by, but um, during the height of the pandemic, there was a war that started in Armenia with um, mm-hmm. Azerbaijan and. Um, you know, not to get too political or whatever, get into all of that, because that is a whole can of worms to, you know, don't want to do that. But we all came together because it was just major crisis mode. There's a lot of Armenians who got displaced from their ancestral lands, and we wanted to come together and do something. And, you know, our channel was art. And like you're saying, too, like, you know, I've been working with my cultural stuff and my own personal things a lot so it was a you know um a coming together of of all the armenians like in the industry which was which would never really happen i mean i've worked with i've come across plenty of armenians like at at pixar and you know we're a small collective of human beings on this planet but it was really fun to see like how many of us one there there was in the industry like it kind of like brought all of us together for this like Like one community yeah Yeah. and and um which was like amazing and the people like through social media that we met uh the team that we assembled like they're just incredible human beings and that whole experience was just like like just the like some of the most important work at the time and now too like i feel like i've done you know um and we brought to like there's so many generous artists in our industry that um came together and and contributed artwork you know and at the time too there was so much misinformation so much like news and things like that which could have deterred anyone you know because you know nowadays people are very cautious with where they tread and you know um so the 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 souls that decided to like be a part of that and put their beautiful creations to it towards that cause it was like it felt really it felt really great and it felt very like it it gave us a lot of like it was very healing you know it was a healing experience because you know that whole thing too it's like you know you as human beings with like these history with these uh the history of your culture and people and like it just these old wounds felt like they just came up to surface again and and you had this collective of like really beautiful people and art like coming to help you know so that that was really yeah. powerful and it was a really great experience to go through and um we raised uh we raised like twenty thousand dollars and we donated towards amazing, children yeah. of media fund. Yeah. Amazing. So that yeah, it was pretty amazing. It was a really great experience all around. Yeah. Yeah. I'll definitely put the link to uh animations for Armenia as well so people will go and follow and if they like to support this um like um, page in your community as well and um yeah I, I was also seeing that a lot of like artists were uh coming doing auctions and helping and uh it's really nice to see whatever it doesn't matter like what ha- what's happening in the world um 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 i also talk about this with my guests as well because um a lot of times it's like a personal thing for you and when artists try to use their art for cause it's just something beautiful i mean um yeah i like for example i had like portland she was um like half iranian half um come from like um black family and when black lives matter started she was doing such same same thing doing auctions with her art for um like black lives matter as well so um it just really interesting how a i don't know a, a cause can bring so much people together for something good and with your art you can just raise money and raise awareness and yeah definitely absolutely well said totally yeah it's so Mm -hmm. powerful and we have such a 
amazing community of like our animation communities like yeah. we all like ha- we have each other you know like it, it, there's such a big support system out there and it's you know you really you really get to see like the humanity of people with with really hard things that you know whatever's yeah. going on like you said yeah so <laughs> yeah i'm going to wrap things up now so do you also have any like dream projects to one day maybe put i don't know a more personal story bring more personal story into life or i don't know direct your own i don't know story or something or what are you working at the moment can you tell me more about your recent stuff yeah recent stuff so i left pixar like about a year and a half ago um and i've just gone into freelance so that's what yeah. I'm doing. I'm having, yeah, I'm having a lot of fun just like jumping around and um, working on different projects with different people, which, uh, you know, at Pixar, like, you know, you, which is great. Like you work with the same people um, and, you know, being out in the world, like you have more, um, if you work with different, different people. people yeah. yeah, totally. Yeah. So it's, it's yeah. different. <laughs> it's different. And um, as far as. And like, are you good at your managing your time now like because freelancing needs a little like more discipline and more time management because it's not like (laughs) normal work routine anymore no it's it's totally different but i feel like the you know working from home during the pandemic like it totally made us like shift gears with like trying to um manage all of that and you know you still have your deadlines you still have art reviews and all of those things so you know, um, it's totally fine on that front. I guess it's just more like carving out, like I'm going to be like setting my space, like the little studio space that I have here of like, this is my work. Space. Like this mm-hmm. is my, this is where I'm going to work. So just setting oh, okay. that intention and being like, no one's going to bother me. Everyone knows like, you know, I'm working. So, you know, I think like you can carve out your, <laughs> what you need. <laughs> Uh, but there's definitely a learning curve not to like not to downplay that but yeah I feel like it's going okay I'm just doing my best to like roll with the punches and go with the flow uh yeah that's working well as well as it can be (laughs) (laughs) good luck with that good luck with that um also I forgot to say that you and Diana also had this podcast called straight again calves but you are not working on it anymore, but there were like few episodes that people can go and listen as well. So you've been hosting podcasts before. So now you are on the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> it's been many years. It's the last time yeah. I was recorded. I know. I know. It was like many years ago now. So do you want to add anything or say anything to people who love animation, love character design, or I don't know, they love your work, they look up into you, or I don't know, whatever you want to say. Well, for anyone who wants to, like, you know, who loves animation and the craft and, and all of that, like, I guess, I guess I would say, like, you know, work on you, you know, like, work on your voice, work on the things that you like, you know, bring your awareness to you, because a lot, like, the one big thing that I'm learning and, and um, with my career is, like, how much I went outside of myself thinking that I had to do things differently than what I liked or what I, you know, what resonated with me. And, you know, you know, you realize like all along that it's, it's the stuff that you like, like the studios just want to know you as an artist. Um, what can you bring to the table and, and be brave enough, I guess, to like, to know that if you give that a fair shot, you know, and, and if it doesn't resonate or, or whatever, if you think it doesn't, like, move on, like, you have all the power, you know, like, you have all the power to create what you want, you know, work hard, um, and follow your dreams, and, and, and follow what resonates with you in your heart, you know, as cheesy as it sounds, but, (laughs) yeah, that's one thing that I'm just trying to do more of, I guess, in my own life at this point, so, do you, you do you, (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> you do you wow. so yeah you're here sorry everyone <laughs> thank you so much for your time and i really enjoyed it know more about you and your career thank you so much 
Thank you so much. Thank you for um, uh, the beautiful questions and and your bright shining face and um, <laughs> you're shining you. actually. <laughs> I literally, you're literally have, like, shining. Blasting, you're blasting in my face. <laughs> you are literally <laughs> shining. <laughs> All right. Okay. Thank you so much, everyone, for listening to this podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, please do not forget to share it with your friends. And if you like, you can support by following me on every social media and also YouTube. As I mentioned before, I'm planning to have a little bit of changes to my podcast. So if you have any recommendation or any special guests that you want me to invite or any subject that you want me to talk about. So please drop me a message and I'll do my best to make it come true. Until next episode, take care and I'll see you very soon.